We are continuing our experience together this morning in Mark's Gospel, chapter 2 and 3. Life is ever moving from the simple to the complex. Some of the first syllables we ever said as children were monosyllables, at least I hope they were. If not, you're a precocious child. Mama and Dada and Gaga and Goo Goo. And as time progressed, we learned to say more sophisticated things. We became more sophisticated in our relationships. The first people we came to know well was our mom and dads. Gradually, we came to understand that we have aunts and uncles and cousins and grandfathers and grandmothers, and there's a whole web of relationships which we become introduced to. And the older you are, the more you grow, the more you realize that while some things remain incredibly simple, other things become very complex. One of the processes of growing up is to somehow live sane in a very complex world and understand that that world is complex. In my teenage years, when I began to understand that complexity was coming upon me, I had longings to return to more simplistic days. I had fantasies of becoming President of the United States. Girls have had fantasies of becoming Miss America. You tend at that age often to think of the world as revolving around you. And the more you learn and grow, kind of maturity, you've come to the recognition that we're one among three billion others, a small part of us. The world is going on by, and it's complex in the world of knowledge. It's complex in the world of relationships. And we've got to learn to get along with the complexity. It's fascinating to see Jesus reveal himself in the Gospel of Mark. In very simple terms, he comes to the disciples, even as life in the natural happens to us first, in very simple terms. He stands by the shores of the Lake of Galilee. He stands in the cities and in the marketplaces and in the village pathways, and he says, Follow me. I'm someone whom you can trust. I'm someone who has power over evil. I'm someone who helps others. I'm someone who knows God. And the disciples, without knowing the complexity of his existence, take off to follow him. He comes to them as one unknown, but in their discovery together, he will manifest himself, even as he does to each of us who've fallen under his impact. As we look at Mark chapter 2 and 3 today, we will see the complexity of Jesus' personality as it emerges through four statements which he makes about himself in chapter 2. And we will also see today the impact that Jesus makes upon the world through four kinds of impacts in Mark chapter 3. In Mark chapter 2, Jesus is presenting through his actions and his teachings, learning concepts for the disciples to get a hold of so that they might begin to have a grasp of his identity. One of the first learning concepts he presents to them in Mark chapter 2 is the concept of calling himself the physician. Chapter 2, verse 17. When Jesus heard it, he said to them, Those who are well have no need of a physician, but those who are sick. I came not to call the righteous, but sinners. The physician. There are times when we are hurt, when we don't need a physician. Every once in a while I cut myself when I'm shaving. But if you cut off your arm, quite obviously you need a physician. A styptic pencil may help if you nick yourself in shaving, but friends... Something more complicated is needed when you cut off an arm. You may have a small skin blemish which can be easily and surgically removed and can be done by a general practitioner who is accomplished in many fields and therefore specialist in none. But if, on the other hand, you have a tumor on the brain and you want to get someone who is acquainted with the complexities of the human mind to go in and go after it, now, Jesus as a physician is coming into life and under no pretense that he's simply helping people who could help themselves. 
persons whose sin is, as it were, the nature of needing a styptic pencil or needing a, a small blemish removed. Jesus Christ comes into life in the fundamental understanding that there is something so radically wrong within each of us that only He has the power to deal with it, the power to put it together, the power to cure it. We face ourselves alone without God and come to an honest recognition of our need before God. We come to the ancient confession, all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. There is none righteous, no, not one, except the Lord Jesus Christ. The great physician has come into life to put it together for people who are hurting and who have sinned. He shows this quality in Capernaum. He's in a house. The pack of people is around him. There is a man who is a paralytic whose friends want him to be healed. He wants to be healed as well, not being able to get into the room. They do the convenient thing of climbing on the roof and coming down through the easily removable tile flat structure and drop him into the room. Jesus, his first glance at him, is one which immediately catches us with surprise. For Jesus does not address his apparent illness, but Jesus addresses something which is on his inside. He says to him, My son, your sins are forgiven. Who and how could this man be a sinner? He never had the physical capacity to go out and do the ordinary acts of sin that we associate with sin, such as robbing a bank or stealing a car or pouring gasoline, sugar in a gasoline tank or slashing tires, gross acts of immorality. These were off limits to him because of his physical condition. But Jesus, in looking at him, recognized immediately within him that this man, like us all, had a problem with sin. His problem, because he was a paralytic, was probably interior. And it's easy, no matter who we are, whether we're physically well or physically incapacitated, to have problems of the mind, wishing to commit the sins other people are committing, becoming in thought what others are in deed. It's very possible that this man was even bitter toward God in what had happened to him in his life, that he may have even been bitter toward his family and resentful toward those who had come in contact with him. It is so easy for this man to have the philosophy that one, if he is not well on the outside, must necessarily, therefore, not be well on the inside. Jesus came to say, you can always be well on the inside. So Jesus meets this man, and he first of all addresses what he perceives. This man's fundamental problem is, as physician, he speaks. The great physician the kind of surgery and illness that no other physician can cope with. My son, your sins be forgiven you. It is a word which penetrates deep into his soul. And as he is released inwardly, the Lord then releases him to live outwardly as well. It is this issue of the forgiveness of sins which initiates the controversy against Jesus in the Gospel of Mark. Through chapter 1, there is no opposition other than that of satanic opposition. There is no human opposition in chapter 1. But beginning in chapter 2, the opposition toward Jesus is created. Why? It's because of his claim to stand alone among the religions of men. To stand alone among all mortals who have ever lived. To alone say, penetratingly and probingly, to each of us in this room, My son... My daughter, your sins be forgiven you. He says that. And it initiates the opposition. It is still the reason why Jesus is opposed and not universally accepted because he makes a claim that no one else has the temerity to make. He stands there and he says, I'm the great physician. It's a concept the disciples, all disciples, must become aware of and believe. He also, in this beautiful passage in Mark chapter 2, presents another learning concept for the disciples in telling the disciples that he is the bridegroom. He indicates in verse 19, Jesus said to them, Can the wedding guests fast while the bridegroom is with them? As long as they have the bridegroom with them, they cannot fast. Jesus indicates he's the bridegroom. Our culture and the culture in which Jesus was raised are two entirely different things. 
In our culture, the object of the bridegroom is to get away from the crowd on the wedding night. To take off and to leave the others, hopefully lost in the maze of streets chasing through the city. But in biblical days, people didn't have cars to be able to get away or motor scooters. So the culture demanded something else, and an inversion occurred. That instead of the bridegroom and the bride trying to escape from their friends, the friends and the community and the family became part of that beginning of the marriage, so that if one had the economic means, he floated a feast for a week following his marriage so that all the friends and the family could join in the celebration of the beautiful new life that had been created by two becoming one. The bridegroom wanted his friends to be around during his marriage, and that's what Jesus says about himself. His disciples are his friends, and he has come with a joy into life. It's fun to be around a bridegroom, particularly if they're not overly, overly nervous. They're tremendously excited. I stood with bridegrooms. It's a joyous thing to share in that great significant occasion. And Jesus has come to have a share. Eventually, in the epistles, we become the bride. But for now, the disciples are the friends of the bridegroom. And Jesus and the two learning concepts of physician and bridegroom shows us two sides to the coin of human experience. That on the one side, we recognize that we are in need of help and that we have sinned and that we are dealing with a very serious, the most serious issue we will ever face. And in dealing with sin and, and sometimes being defeated by it, even in our Christian life, one can live on the downbeat with a certain air of pessimism. But Jesus comes along and says, uh, there is joy, there's liberation, there's release. There's peace. And we see him both as the one in life who is concerned with the most serious undertaking, but on the other hand, the one who goes through life with a lilt, with a joy, with a lift. I see Jesus in saying that he is the bridegroom. I see him as one who taught us to live life with joy and with a smile. The Gospels never tell us about Jesus cracking a joke. I don't know if he ever did or not. Maybe to some it would be irreverent to suppose that he did. But I know he had a tremendous sense of humor. You can't help but pick it up as you go through the Gospels. He enjoyed people. He wants us to know that he is approachable. God is not distant and removed. He is brought near in his Son, Christ Jesus, the bridegroom, his friend. We are. It's a learning concept. Jesus as a person is enjoyable to be around. If your association with the, with the church or with religion is not enjoyable and uplifting and liberating, then the problem is not in Jesus. The problem is in the religion. Jesus is a joyous person to be around and to be with. A third learning concept that Jesus presents to the disciples in chapter 2 is that he is the Lord of the Sabbath. Chapter 2, verse 28. The Son of Man is Lord even of the Sabbath. In Mark chapter 2, there are four occasions in which Jesus comes in conflict with people. The first occasion he comes in conflict is over the issue of his forgiving the sins of the paralytic. The second time he comes in conflict is with John's disciples who charge that Jesus is not behaving like John. And Jesus says, I can't. A third occasion of conflict is Jesus allowing the disciples to pick grain on the Sabbath. And a fourth occasion of conflict in Mark chapter 2 and on into chapter 3, actually, the first paragraph is Jesus healing on the Sabbath, the man with a withered hand. And in all these areas of conflict, Jesus is showing himself as, what we may say, Lord of the Sabbath or Lord of tradition. Now, one can't help but read Mark chapter 2 when Jesus is talking about tradition and not make some implications to our tradition as people. You know, there are good traditions and there are bad traditions. There are good traditions we as a church should get into, and then there are traditions we should avoid. Good traditions we as individuals should become involved in, and likewise bad ones we should avoid. Paul, in writing to his churches on several occasions, made mention of the fact that they should follow certain traditions. He tells the Corinthians in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 2, Follow my ways, follow my traditions, which you have seen me live and heard me speak about. In 2 Thessalonians Chapter 2, verse 15, he says, Brethren, hold fast to the traditions which have been given to you. So there's a good aspect to tradition. 
There is not necessarily anything wrong with tradition. I like tradition, in fact, if it's good tradition. My dad tells this terribly old, worn-out story from the days when he was a, a young person, but evidently they hadn't paved some of, a lot of the roads yet in Pennsylvania, and those were the days of the Model T. And uh, Dad tells the story that one road he went down, which had been traveled many times by Model Ts, had a sign at the beginning which said, Choose your rut well. You will be in it for the next 20 miles. <laughs> and I like tradition. I like uh, regular order to a daily life. Nothing wrong with it. But there are also bad traditions. Paul says in Galatians chapter 1, verse 14, that he had walked in the traditions of his fathers. He came to understand that those traditions were wrong. How do we separate good tradition from bad tradition? How do we tell when tradition has gone astray? That's what Mark 2 is talking about. I'll share with you some indicators of how to tell when tradition goes astray, how to guard against tradition going astray in your life, or how to guard against tradition going astray as far as the church is concerned. Tradition, to, to, mm. <laughs> that word uh, <coughs> goes astray when Jesus Christ is not Lord. Whenever man-made rules become the governing factor and Jesus Christ is not the Lord of the tradition, then the tradition has gone astray. That's a very clear implication of Mark chapter 2. Anything which we do on a regular order, we must ask the question, is Jesus Christ Lord of what I'm doing on this regular basis? Another mark of when tradition goes astray is when tradition concentrates on the outside of man rather than on the inside of man. It's interesting to look at the Pharisees and how they arose as a historical movement in Judaism that came into being in the middle of the second century as a revival and reform effort in Judaism in order to keep Judaism from being swallowed up in Greek ideas and Greek polytheistic uh, mythology. The Pharisees arose as a party which believed in revival, which believed in reform, which believed in a vital individual personal experience with God and which believed in the resurrection of the dead. But somewhere along the line in the course of their history, they began to turn inward rather than outward. And they became an exclusive group rather than really doing the job that God had called them to do within their own faith. Jesus addresses this group. Because in Phariseeism we see the model of all traditional religion which is not in under the headship of Christ. Traditional religion under, outside of the headship of Christ emphasizes the outside of man rather than the inside and therefore, because it emphasizes the outside, it emphasizes rules. Whereas if it emphasized the inside, it would emphasize relationships. Traditional religion outside of God is rules, and if you keep them, you're related to God. Jesus said, relationships. If you're not related to your fellow man in a loving, forgiving way, you can't be related to God. There are some rules that are good rules, but any rule not under the headship of Christ is a bad rule. Outer religion produces rules, and you know what rules produce? Rules produce walls. But religion on the inside, Jesus Christ on the inside, produces bridges rather than walls. God has meant us as His people to not be isolated by a moat of holiness through which we cannot pass to the world and it cannot pass to us. He wants us to be holy, separate, undefiled on the inside, but that doesn't mean that we in some physical way mark ourselves like the Hare Krishna sect to show that we're different. We are in the world, but not of it. Jesus concentrates on the inside. That's where the problems are. And any tradition which concentrates on the outside steps outside of the authority of Jesus Christ. Another thing which happens in traditional religion outside of Christ when it goes astray is that that kind of tradition doesn't have any shrink or stretch left. Jesus uses two small parables in Mark chapter 2. One is the shrink parable. You do not put an unshrunk piece of cloth on a shrunken garment. Why? Because all the shrink has already been taken out of the larger piece, and when the whole garment, now patched, goes to the washing machine, 
that small unshrunk patch will draw off the rest. All the shrink has been taken out of the garment. And the wineskins, all the stretch has been taken out of them. That's why you don't pour new wine into old wineskins, because the old wineskins were already used for one fermentation process where there was gaseous expansion, and they had the stretch to cope with the change. But they couldn't cope with another change. They were taut, T-A-U-T, and couldn't bend or move. Now, tradition without the Lord is straight jacket religion. It is binding. It is offensive to God and to man because it does not liberate. The Lord wants us as his church to follow into tradition, which releases us to always be adaptable to new ways the Holy Spirit is working. The Holy Spirit doesn't change his theology from year to year. That's constant the same. But the Holy Spirit will sure change his methods from generation to generation and his approaches. And we need to be bendable and pliable rather than rigid and unbending. I have to examine my traditions when I come across Jesus. I had a concept of preaching when I entered seminary. I came from uh, um, an aura of preaching which associated good preaching as uh, start strong and loud on a high pitch and continue until you exhaust yourself with the highest pitch and the highest tone at the close of the message. And I remember my first class in preaching at Fuller Seminary. I thought, I'm going to give these guys a sermon like the which they have never heard before, these deadheads. And I chose, naturally, Elijah, for he's the flaming prophet which to give a flaming message on. And uh, I stood up before the class. I started loud. I started fast, and I started high. And the only way I had to emphasize from then on was to keep going louder, higher, and faster. And I, when I finished, I s said to myself with kind of an inner grin of satisfaction, I have just probably delivered the best message that this school has ever had the privilege to hear. <laughs> My roommate, whom I respected deeply as a devoted servant of Christ, handed in his critique, and everybody in the class had to hand in a critique at the end of a message, and his critique was, who do you think you are? You see, he knew me. He knew what kind of person I was and how I talked. Who do you think you are? As if I was some strange person up there. Do you think you're the Pope speaking ex cathedra? And he really did me in, and all of a sudden I began to realize that I had a tradition of what preaching was without an understanding that basically... Preaching is communication. And that if persons are tuned to hearing a sermon which is loud and fast, then, as Paul did, become all things to all people and use that which communicates. I began to discover, however, that uh, most people do not, and therefore I had to change my tradition. I think it, was, it is well when we evaluate traditions, even in worship. It's well. Sometimes during prayer, I find myself going by rote rather than for real. It's possible within the fellowship of a charismatic congregation to sometimes do things because everyone else is doing them, or because we've always done it before, or we've always said the same words before. But Jesus is for real, not for rote. And the key is to being fresh and alive and moving with the Lord and having the stretch to go. This congregation is exciting because there are so many changes that happen. I thank God for people who have the capacity to change and to move on. Another concept which Jesus um, really relates to in knowing when tradition goes astray is tradition goes astray when people who are hurting are passed by for the sake of our theology. Here's a man sitting in the synagogue with a withered hand, and Jesus is being dared to heal him on the Sabbath. Now, you'd have to follow the theology that would allow that kind of staring to go on in respect to Jesus. In the religious faith of Jesus' period, there were 39 categories of labor which were pre prevented on the Sabbath. Things like sewing, reaping, baking, tying a knot, untying a knot, writing, etc., etc., 
Uh, in respect to healing, if you had a sore throat on the Sabbath day, you were not permitted to gargle with vinegar, which was one of the medical helps that was employed. The reason being that when you are ill on the Sabbath, you can use anything which will help you from getting worse, but you cannot use anything to help you to get better, because that is to work. Well, you see, Jesus could heal the man with a withered hand on Monday. He wouldn't have to rock the boat. He could heal him on Sunday, just any day but the Sabbath. Jesus, however, you know, when theology becomes confusing and you can't understand what's going on, then you'd have to say that, you know, there's something wrong. Last few Sunday nights when I've gotten home, uh, when it's late evening, I've turned on, and I hope I don't get a libel suit on this, O.L. Jaggers uh, from the World Church. If anybody's confusing, an idiot, uh, any, and, but big words and, you know, all these super dimensional terms, but, you know, I have the foggiest notion of what the man's saying. It's just all complicated. It's ridiculous. Jesus has a way of piercing through in simplicity. Now, don't go out and watch all Jaggers. I see some of you who's, a, you know, please, you've got better things to do. But Jesus looks at that synagogue and he says, is it lawful on the Sabbath day to do good or to do harm? To save life or to kill. And you know what makes him angry? For the text says he's angry. Nobody has the stamina to stand up and answer a simple question. Is it wrong on the Sabbath to do good? Theology is so complicated that a simple question cannot be answered. God help us be simple so that we can answer simple questions with quick affirmations. And that we see people helped rather than hindered by what we believe. Now, Jesus, in his learning concepts in Mark chapter 2, shows himself as the physician, the bridegroom, Lord of the Sabbath. And also, he uses the term, Son of Man. Perhaps of all the terms which are used to describe Jesus, this one is the most complex. It is a term which Christ deliberately employs in description of himself. Fourteen times the term is used in the Gospel of Mark. And every time it is used, it is Jesus who uses it of himself. It's never used by another person. He uses it because he stands within the fulfillment of what Daniel prophesied in Daniel 7, that there would come four successive world empires, which would finally, at the end of the age, manifest itself in a world ruler which is anti-God, and that in the midst of that anti-God emergence, Daniel is lifted up to heaven to see the Ancient of Days seated upon a throne, and he sees one coming to the Ancient of Days, the Son of Man, who receives from the Ancient of Days the Old Testament designation for God the Father, who receives from the Ancient of Days power and glory and dominion, a kingdom which is an everlasting dominion which cannot pass away, so that all nations, languages, tribes, and people should serve him. His kingdom is without end. Jesus says, I'm that Son of Man. There were people who looked at him and said, and heard him and, and certainly did not associate with that with Daniel 7. You mean the carpenter from Nazareth says he's the son of man? But it was a term which Jesus was using to conceal truth from those who were too lazy to look for it, but to reveal his inner mystery to those who would penetrate and come through to an understanding. Here is the person walking the byways of Galilee and Judea who holds in his name and authority, all power and dominion, the culmination of human governments that have ever come and gone, the beginning and the end of human history, the Lord of every individual, Son of Man, he says, and he is. Mark chapter 8, verse 38, he says, whoever would deny me before men, him also will I, the Son of Man, will deny when he comes in the glory of his Father with all the holy angels. He says in Mark chapter 13, that you will see the Son of Man descending on Clouds of great glory and power, Son of Man, the apex of history. These are the learning concepts that Jesus is working to impress his disciples with. And as Jesus moves in his ministry, he impacts. He impacts upon the masses. Chapter 3, verse 7 through verse 12. Crowds came to him. They walked from as far as 125 miles to the south, Idiomia. They walked to him from the from the northwestern seaport towns of Tyre and Sidon, perhaps 30 to 50 miles. They come from the north and the east, the south and the west. They come and the crush around Jesus is so great that he is fearful that they will crush him out of existence if it, that were possible. So he gets into a boat and teaches from the side and heals. I'm amazed at Jesus here. His love and mercy for the mass. You would have thought that he would have said, 
as a crowd was crushing other people and elbowing other people and cutting in line in front of other people to bring their sick to Jesus, you would have thought that he'd have said, now before I'm going to heal anybody in this crowd, you're going to start exercising some good manners. And a crush ain't the way to do it. You know, very easily at that point, he could have turned a screw into the crowd and tightened down on them and lectured them and moralized with them. But his heart is open. His compassion is great. And he, he loves the people, not simply as a mass, but individually, so that while the mass is gathering around him, nevertheless, he is touching people individually. He doesn't send his word and heal the mass and toto. That he could have done. But instead, he heals one by one as they came to him. Why? Because it's always the individual with Jesus. Always the individual touch. Not just the crowd, but the person. And he cares. He cares about everyone in this room. He cares about you. Jesus loves. He impacts on the mass. Jesus also impacts upon the disciples. They are being called to follow. How all of us, I hope, it is our prayer that in this room we want to come out of simply being a person who is a spectator to what Jesus is doing and receiving his benefits. We want to come from that into the inner circle of fellowship. The gospel provides us that opportunity. The Holy Spirit gives us the chance. So we come in to the inner sanctuary of association with him. And what does Jesus tell the disciples? He says, I called you. Why? To be with me, first of all. That's the call. Not to do anything, but to be with me. And then go out, preach, and have power. But he calls them. Divergently, even as in this room we are divergent. Sons of thunder, James and John. I can't imagine the writer of John's gospel, that meek and beautiful and tender person John, who so emphasizes the word love, ever having been having been the pistol described as a son of thunder, a thunderbolt personality. Jesus changes him. He puts Matthew, the tax collector, in the same group with Simon, the Canaanian, or the zealot. One, a political revolutionary who hated the government, and the other guy who served the government and was a quisling. He put them together, just as he's putting us together. So widely are we different in so many ways. But the miracle of the church, the miracle of the fellowship of Jesus, is that what we have in common transcends any differences which we have ever possessed. Christ's prayer is that the church may be one. It is that with which I live and breathe, because it is the cry of Jesus Christ himself, our high priest. He impacts upon the disciples. Jesus also impacts upon the strong man, Satan. It is the strong man's house whom he is plundering. He is plundering that house through deliverances from demon possession. And he is plundering that house through healing the sick and forgiving sin. In these days when people are lining up for four hours to see the exorcist in West Los Angeles. When people are becoming attracted again to the fact that there is supernatural power in the world. It is great to go to the Gospel of Mark, which of all the Gospels shows Jesus' authority over demons and over possession. To signify that here is one who has come with authority and he has bound the strong man. And wherever Jesus Christ enters into life, your life or mine, there you have been unbound. Satan who bound you no longer has control. I have thought of him this week as a person who's left sitting in a corner, totally strapped. The only thing that Jesus hasn't done is he hasn't muzzled him. He can still talk. But he's kind of strapped around a post. And as I see him there, I think of him as someone who may wish, but who cannot will. He wishes lots of destructive things for me. He wishes I would go to hell with him. He wishes to annihilate my personality. He wishes to unglue every aspect of what I am involved in for God's sake, if he could, just as he was with you. He can wish, but he cannot will. He has no power. And he can complain, but he cannot control. I feel terribly sorry and hurt over Christians in our day who have been talking about other believers being possessed of Satan. What a terrible misreading of the gospel. Whom the Son sets free is free indeed. The strong man has been bound by whom? A stronger man, Jesus our Lord, who has set us free to live. Satan may complain, he may suggest, but he cannot dominate, he cannot control. His power is broken. Sometimes we may interpret his words of suggestion as if he were in control, but one needs to have the eye of the supernatural physician 
to differentiate between control and suggestion. You are free when you are in Christ. He has bound a strong man. That's the impact that he makes. And Jesus also impacts upon us in the sense that he draws us into his family. His mother, his brother, and his sisters come to him. And again, there's a crowd. As always with Jesus in these early chapters, there is a crowd around him. The press is great. And his mother and his family cannot get in, so they send word that they are asking. And Jesus, when he hears the word, Mark says, looked around. Now there are twice in Mark chapter 3 where Mark uses that verb, looked around. And it means literally to start at one end of the assembly and to eyeball by eyeball move successively over the faces of each individual, looking at them in a moment of silence, drawing everyone's attention until the place is totally silent. And when he has everyone's attention, in Mark 3, verse 5, he says with anger to the man, stretch out your hand. He's angry at the crowd for their hostility to God's ways. But at the end of Mark chapter 3, he looks around again, this time not in anger, but this time in words of invitation. Again, seeing the individual in the mass, not looking at the crowd as a blur of undistinguished faces, but individually, momentarily, pausing with each one, saying, whoever does my father's will is a part of my family, my mother, my brother, and my sister. The great gospel of Mark, this wonderful story of the Lord Jesus Christ, is telling us that we are in Christ. We belong to the family of God. And Jesus impacts on us and draws us to himself that we might forever be joined with his company, his association. Let us pray. We are glad today, Lord, to belong to your family. There are some here in age that are your mothers and fathers in the sense that they're older but they're your family. And there are others of us who would have been equal in age to you when you walked the shores of Galilee. We are your brothers and sisters, and there are others who are younger who could be called sons and daughters. But all of us, in one way or another, can lay title to the claim. We are the children of God. We belong. We thank you that through the gospel, which you have caused to be given to us through faithful writer and servants that in this gospel we see you for who you are not what men think you are not what the popularity contests say you are but we see you as you really are we believe your witness we believe that you of all people would never lie to us that you of all people would never deceive us. So we accept your witness, we believe it, and there is rest and quiet in our heart because we have found you and you have found us whom to know is life eternal. Grant that each person in this room this morning will know the joyous experience